Great, thank you so much, Emily. Well, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of the Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families, I wanna thank you for joining us today. The Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families was founded three years ago. We set out our vision, which was simply to provide education and advocacy around vaccinations. Over the last three years, we've hosted an annual day at the Capitol. We've built a grassroots advocacy network, and we've partnered with dozens of organizations to bring science-based information to Oklahomans and to Oklahoma leaders. When it comes to vaccines, there is a lot of misinformation. We've all heard the myths and we've all seen the memes. The rise of social media has fostered a decline in the number of Oklahomans and indeed Americans who know the facts when it comes to vaccinations. Fear has become the ruling factor for far too many people who are making healthcare decisions for themselves or for their minor children. Misinformation and disinformation are largely responsible for the increase in vaccine exemptions in Oklahoma in recent years. The number of approved vaccination exemptions, these are people who do not vaccinate their children, increased by more than 60% from 877 exemptions in 2014 to 1,434 in 2019, according to the CDC. Anti-vaxxers are actively working to scare parents into not vaccinating their children by preventing Oklahomans from receiving educational information on life-saving vaccines. And while there is not currently an approved COVID vaccine for children, the work anti-vaxxers have done in Oklahoma has been enough to scare some adults from being vaccinated. But as adults, we have a choice. We can choose to listen to myths and spread on social media, or we can listen to doctors and scientists who have devoted their lives to saving ours. Our medical community is united on vaccines. They save lives. And so I'm here today to introduce a first of its kind public service campaign. Today, we are introducing television and digital ads to encourage our fellow Oklahomans to follow the science. But when it comes to vaccines, we are united for good. So at this time, I'd like to pause and play the spot, a 60 second spot for you. COVID-19 isn't the flu. It isn't a common cold. It's far more deadly. It has changed everything. But now there's hope. Doctors have heard the call and after a rigorous scientific process, vaccines are here. Vaccines are safe. They've helped eradicate diseases that were once common just a generation ago. They're trusted by members of the U.S. military, by other nations, and by our greatest generation. Doctors have done their part. It's time to do ours for our country, for our state, for our community, for each other. Getting vaccinated against COVID-19 means we can fully open our businesses, our schools, and our homes faster, safer, so let's get vaccinated and get back to normal. We're in this together for good. A message from the Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families and these proud Oklahoma partners for good. Okay. So that was the 60 second version, uh, but the campaign also includes 30 second and a 15 second spot, as well as digital ads built for social media in both Spanish and English language. The campaign has just begun and we can expect to see more over the coming weeks and months. Our message is clear, vaccines save lives. They are the safest, fastest way to fully open our homes and our businesses and to restore our pre-pandemic lives as we were able. We are united for good and we're asking our fellow Oklahomans to be vaccinated for good too. The United for Good Vax for Good campaign is the result of collaboration between the Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families Integris, Mercy, OU Health, SSM Health, the Oklahoma State Medical Association, and the Chickasaw Nation. And you'll hear from each of these partners today. I also want to recognize Dr. Paul Mussarelli, I'm sorry, <laughs> and the Oklahoma Dental Association, the Oklahoma City County Health Department, and Passport Health, who are joining us today. And we have provided and have, who have provided support for this project. 
The individuals and the organizations they represent truly care about the state and we are proud to call home. Their passion and their willingness to provide care on some of the most difficult days we have ever had and ever hope to see has been inspiring. The death of gratitude we all owe to our healthcare workers can never be repaid. To speak about the collaborative response among the healthcare community in Oklahoma at this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Kersey Winfrey. Thank you, Jacqueline, for this opportunity to share my reflections on our community's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. When COVID-19 impacted our community nearly one year ago to the day, our health systems began ramping up to response. We used all of our medical knowledge to address this novel, highly contagious, and unfortunately fatal viral illness. We are not a stranger to the need to implement our disaster plans. We have prepared them, drilled them regularly, and refined them based on experience from other disasters we have faced in our community. We went to work quickly to implement the plans, but this time for a pandemic that would bring a tsunami of fear um, and illness to our community. All of the health systems quickly realized that the key to responding was collaboration within the medical community. And collaborate we did for such challenges as advocating for the community to follow standards, working with the city and state government officials to encourage the use of masks, addressing how to respond to shortages of critical personal protective equipment, as well as other medical supplies such as ventilators and the unheard of prospect of an ICU bed shortage. What will always stay with me is the tremendous service and dedication by nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists, and healthcare workers from all over the world who are called to care for others. The sacrifice of our staff on the front lines has been nothing short of remarkable. They are heroes in the truest definition of the term. Our caregivers have shown compassion in the face of terrible virus that was making their patients ill in ways we have not seen before. They fulfilled their calling in life at a time when they also risk exposure themselves and to that of their families. We have witnessed innovative thinking to care for our patients who need us for conditions other than COVID. So, such as some of these solutions have been telehealth and virtual visits. Now we face the next stage of our community response, the hope we have been waiting for for the past 12 months, the availability of a vaccine and the process of ensuring everyone has an opportunity to access it. I know as we move into this next and all important phase of the pandemic, the collaboration will continue and together we will win the fight against COVID-19. To tell you more about that, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jess Campbell from Mercy Health. Thank you very much, Dr. Winfrey. At Mercy, we were honored to join with the Oklahoma City County Health Department to host the very first public vaccine clinic in Oklahoma County at our Minders Neuroscience Institute on January 7th. On that day, we vaccinated 1,200 people that were ages 65 and older. And I will never forget the feeling in the room that day, the tangible feeling of hope and relief those feelings that have felt very foreign to many healthcare workers over the last year. Many of our frontline coworkers volunteered that day and it really felt like for the first time we got to switch from playing defense to offense. And since that day in early January, Mercy has now administered more than 40,000 vaccines to Oklahomans. We've come a long way in a short amount of time from vaccinating our own coworkers in December to being part of an effort to vaccinate more than now 50% of the 65 and older population in the state. When our registration links went live back in January, all the spots would be filled in a matter of minutes, just simply due to low supply and great demand. A lot has changed since then. We're seeing more and more vaccine supply flow into our state every week. More appointments are now available and so many more wonderful community partners have mobilized to create substantially more vaccination sites across the county. Earlier this week, you probably heard that the state announced we are moving now into phase three of the vaccine rollout plan. And this is great news for so many more Oklahomans. This means that the following groups are now eligible to book a COVID-19 vaccine appointment. The healthcare workers and first responders, Oklahomans age 65 and older, that were all in phase one. Oklahomans under age 65 with comorbidities such as diabetes, COPD, uh, asthma, um, other illnesses such as that. Now teachers and staff and pre-K pre through 12 for our schools and childcare facilities people living and working in congregate locations and work sites, 
our public health staff, our government leaders and workers, teacher staff and students now age 16 and over in educational settings such as our colleges and universities or career and vocational technology centers. Also the workers for essential businesses and industries are now included as well. When it comes to our public vaccine rollout, we have a lot to celebrate in Oklahoma, but we still have a lot of work ahead of us. We need all of our Oklahomans to get their COVID-19 vaccines as soon as they are eligible and as soon as a vaccine is available for them. Widespread vaccination in our community is crucial to helping our state and our nation achieve herd immunity and return to some sense of normalcy. Our current data estimates that probably only 10 to 25% of COVID infections are truly documented, meaning that the infected patient was either asymptomatic or did not have access to a test to get that positive result. There are many reasons for this. And we also had a shortage of testing supplies at the beginning of this pandemic, if you all remember. That would translate to about a third of our population actually being infected. And if you add that to our current rate of people being vaccinated across the state, we're probably sitting at around about 40% now of the population who either have a natural immunity or now the immunity from the vaccine. And those numbers are hopefully on the conservative side. The CDC and similar experts suggest we need around a 75 to 85% immunity rate in the community to reach what we would call herd immunity, which would cause a resistance to that continued spread of COVID across the community. So this means we need Oklahomans to trust the science and get vaccinated. It's natural to have questions about something new and that's okay. We would encourage you to talk to a trusted healthcare provider and don't let having questions or hesitations stop you from getting this life-saving vaccine. Please talk to your doctor, think it through and get the shot in confidence. It will protect you and the people that you love. As we mentioned earlier, there was a time not too long ago when it was difficult to find a vaccine, but thank thankfully there's been some good news regarding vaccine availability in recent weeks. And here to tell you more about vaccine supply in Oklahoma is my good colleague from Integris, Dr. Julie Watson. Thank you, Dr. Campbell. Not very long ago, we were in the midst of our highest COVID-19 levels to date. In January, nearly 2,000 Oklahomans were hospitalized due to this illness. Today, that number is much lower at 292. The progress we have made is remarkable. This is exactly what we have been hoping for, and waiting for, and praying for. Undoubtedly, the distribution of the vaccine has made significant impact. Federal and state officials, along with health systems, have been working incredibly hard to get the vaccine in the arms of as many Oklahomans as possible as quickly as possible. And we've had great success. To date, over 800,000 Oklahomans have received at least one dose of the vaccine, and more than 400,000 have received both doses. This means over 22% of Oklahomans age 16 and older are fully vaccinated. These are very good numbers and something we should be proud of. As a matter of fact, Oklahoma ranks seventh in the country when it comes to the percent of population being vaccinated. And with the emergency use approval of another vaccine, we are optimistic the number of Oklahomans vaccinated will continue to grow. As more doses become available, more appointments and locations will open up. In fact, Governor Kevin Stitt believes we are very close to supply outpacing demand. He feels confident that anyone who wants a vaccine should be able to get one within the next few months, possibly even the next 30 days. This vaccination effort is unprecedented in speed, magnitude, and scale. Over 93 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine have been administered in the United States. Unity and collaboration are the only things that have made this humanly possible. National, state, and local leaders have all worked alongside health and medical professionals to make this happen. So I urge you, when you get the opportunity to get vaccinated, please take it. Don't hold out for one vaccine over another. All three are effective in preventing hospitalization and death. Everyone here today is unified around that message. To provide more information about vaccine safety, including information about some of the most common vaccine myths, I would like to now introduce Dr. Douglas Drevitz from OU Health. Dr. Drevitz. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Watson. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. So now that vaccines are available, 
vaccine distribution and administration is a top priority worldwide. And there's really great anticipation that this will lead to a gradual return to our pre-COVID lives or as close to that as we will ever get. Vaccines have been preventing disease and saving lives for generations. And in fact, the first vaccines were developed almost 300 years ago against smallpox. But a vaccine that remains in a bottle in a freezer is not helping. It's necessary that people are willing to be vaccinated. And it's important to keep in mind that the willingness to be vaccinated often relies upon a trusting relationship between a healthcare provider and their patient. One key component of this trust is the patient's ability and willingness to ask questions and then to receive factual, well-considered answers. So I'm going to go over a few frequently asked questions that physicians are often being asked about vaccines. So first of all, what is a vaccine? You know, in the simplest definition, it's a substance that's used to stimulate an immune response against a germ or a harmful product of the germ, such as a toxin. And now vaccines are also used to produce immune responses against certain cancers. Next question is, you know, doc, why is it important to be vaccinated? You know, this requires a bit of a history lesson. A hundred years ago, there were over 21,000 cases of smallpox in the United States. In 1920, almost 10,000 individuals died of measles and there were around half a million cases of measles in the United States. And we just don't think about measles being a fatal disease now. In 1920, there were over almost 150,000 cases of diphtheria and 13,000 of those individuals died. I've never seen a case of diphtheria in my career. And also a hundred years ago, there were over 100,000 cases of whooping cough were reported and just over 5,000 of those individuals died. Today, those diseases are almost what we call of historical interest because of vaccines. Your parents or your grandparents will easily remember polio and the fear that polio would create in a community. Every year, people would acquire polio and about 1% of them would have paralytic polio. And it was a terrifying disease. I trained under a gentleman who was a well-known pulmonologist who did part of his training in New York. He told me that when they had power outages in New York City, one of the things that the residents and the fellows had to do was go work the iron lungs in the polio wards because they had quite a few patients who lived there and had to be breathing on an iron lung. When we had our power outages a few weeks ago from the uh, great ice storm in the freeze, we did not have wards full of polio patients on iron lungs that we had to worry about. These diseases have been eliminated because of vaccines. So quite simply, the reason you want to get vaccinated is to prevent an illness, prevent death, and to live much better than we have in the past. Most people would not think about not vaccinating their dog or their cat for rabies, and yet we have hesitancy to get vaccinations for ourselves, and that just does not make sense. Another question is, how does vaccination contain the spread of a disease? And it really comes down to a numbers game. When you get vaccinated, the vaccine stimulates an immune response against a particular, in this case, a germ, the germ that causes COVID-19. And the immune response is com comprised of both antibodies and what we call activated lymphocytes. So when you have a sufficient amount of these antibodies and activated lymphocytes in your system, if you get exposed to the germ, your immune system will kill the germ, bind it up, kill it right at the area in the mucosal surfaces up in your nasopharynx or right after it gets to you. And it doesn't have an opportunity to replicate, to grow, and to make more of itself. And it's really the numbers, in a sense, that prevent the spread. If I get infected with 100 or 1,000 particles that cause COVID-19, but because I'm vaccinated, they are immediately killed and they don't propagate, I'm not going to spread the disease to anybody. On the other hand, if I'm not vaccinated and I'm completely non-immune to this germ, 
if I get the same amount of infection, very soon I will be shedding billions and trillions of infectious viruses out into the community and out into the air whenever I'm talking to somebody or coughing. And so that's how the vaccine prevents spread of the disease. Another common question is, can I get COVID-19 from the vaccination? And that's really a simple answer. It's completely no. You will feel kind of ill, but that's your immune response. And the immune responses often feel the same. The COVID-19 vaccines that are approved for emergency use right now do not contain COVID-19. The mRNA con vaccines contain a small piece of mRNA and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does not contain any COVID-19. It uses a different technology. So you cannot get COVID-19 from the vaccination. Another question is, well, gee, it's a new vaccine. How do I know it's safe? And, and that's a great question. Everybody is concerned about safety just as much as they are concerned about, is it effective? So you have to remember that these vaccines, even though they're produced rapidly, no corners were cut in their safety testing. There were tens of thousands of people in the mRNA trials and in the Johnson & Johnson trials. These vaccines underwent the same rigorous testing process that any other vaccine or any other product would go through by the FDA. And as we've already heard, over 90 million people in the United States have already been vaccinated with the mRNA vaccines. And you're just not seeing the media filled up with cases of people growing a third head or something from the vaccines. It's just not happening. What you're seeing are dramatically reduced numbers of infections. And this is in part due to the vaccination effort. Another common question is what are the known side effects of the COVID-19 vaccine? Well, you can expect to have some pain at the injection site. That's probably the most common thing and upwards of eight out of 10 people will have some pain there. The other things that are quite common are a sense of fatigue or malaise, some muscle aches or pains, and those happen in somewhere between 30 and 50% of individuals and are more common after the second injection of an mRNA vaccine than the first injection. Also, somewhere between 10 and 20, maybe 30% of individuals can have a low-grade fever, chills, and a headache. Most of these side effects are gone in a few days, and then you're good to go. Another very common question that I get, and a very important question is, how long will the vaccine give protective immunity? Well, obviously we're going to find that out. The studies that have been out there show that the immune response or the antibodies in the cells decay, which is the scientific term for sort of go away in a biological sense, relatively slowly. So we anticipate that the vaccine will produce an effective immune response against its original target for several years. Now it is possible that we will need to get a, you might say a booster shot or a sequent vaccination that comprises some of the variants that are now being described. This shouldn't be surprising because that viruses like the virus that causes COVID-19 are designed to mutate. This is simply how they survive in the environment. And as we know from having to get a flu vaccine every year, that vaccination contains four different strains of flu in it. It's not unthinkable that periodically we will have to get a second or a third or a, perhaps a semi-annual or every other year COVID-19 vaccine that may contain several different variants of this coronavirus. In my view, it is a very small price to pay for having something that is so effective at preventing a severe disease. And I know that everybody that's part of this effort today is highly committed to patient care and to fostering trust in patient relationships, especially now when it is so critical that we bond together, and especially when it comes to COVID-19. And that's not unique to hospitals in Oklahoma City, it's unique to the entire healthcare community. And today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. George Monks, the president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association, to say a few words about the coordinated state right response. Thank you, Dr. Trevitz, appreciate that. This past year has been filled with 
unimaginable change, sacrifice, and at times sorrow for too many Oklahomans. And for those of us in healthcare, however, these difficulties have been compounded by the challenge of fighting a new virus that is indiscriminate and deadlier that, than many of the diseases we've seen so far. Throughout this time, we've watched our hospitals and health professionals meet extraordinary challenges with dedication, heart, and innovation. These healthcare heroes have withstood supply challenges, tremendous patient surges, and skepticism from some in the community, all while trying to treat some of the most ill patients in our state. They've shown compassion to patients and families during the darkest moments and celebrated with them when someone has recovered. They've sacrificed personal moments such as family celebrations and holidays just to ensure that those who need medical care can receive it. Now it's our turn to do something for them get vaccinated against COVID-19. This vaccine literally saves lives while allowing us to return to the things we've missed so much this past year, such as family gatherings, social events, and church. It helps teachers return to classrooms and kids return to traditional school days and can keep your loved ones safe from the spread of coronavirus. It truly is a vax for good. Before I introduce our next speaker, I wanna take a moment to thank the healthcare professionals who have devoted long hours, compassion and care to Oklahomans during their most vulnerable moments. We are all in your debt. I would also like to recognize our hospitals and medical centers, especially the four hospital groups who are part of this incredible effort to educate Oklahomans about the benefits of coronavirus vaccine. OU Health, Mercy, Integris, and SSM Health St. Anthony. Your leadership and incredible work this past year saved thousands of lives. At this time, I'd like to welcome Dr. John Kruger, who's the Undersecretary for the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health to discuss their work to vaccinate employees, tribal members, and uh, educate professionals in the community. Thank you, Dr. Monks. I appreciate all the work that OSMA has done as well. So um, as I'm talking today, uh, I was reviewing a uh, article from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly uh, that was released by the CDC in December. And this was an article that caught our attention because it reflects uh, the challenges that we have uh, in Indian country. And it showed that mortality and hospitalizations overall were 1.8 times higher in American Indians and Alaska Natives and that males in our younger demographic, age 20 to 49, were actually more disproportionately affected uh, than other populations um, uh, that would uh, uh, contract coronavirus. Um, as of December 2nd, 2020, the CDC reported 2,689 COVID-19 associated deaths among non-Hispanic American Indian and Alaska Native persons in the United States. These numbers are dated and they probably significantly underreport the deaths uh, that have occurred to American Indians and Alaska Natives across the United States. So for tribal nations, there's a deep memory of communicable disease. The American Indian and Alaska Native population footprint that remains in the Americas has been adversely affected by communicable illnesses such as COVID-19 that tend to affect uh, them very dis disproportionately. Vaccines represent a way to not only protect those vulnerable populations, but also oral traditions, native language, and a way of life by protection of current and future generations. Our statistics uh, to date uh, within the Chickasaw Nation, as you know, within the state of Oklahoma, we've had 7,307 persons that have lost their life to date uh, due to COVID-19, and we certainly mourn them. In our Chickasaw Nation 13 county area, some 520 persons have lost their lives due to this virus. Our hospital, like many hospitals and health systems across the country, has seen the highest rates of death and illness due to a communicable disease in our history. COVID-19 now represents the leading cause of death in the United States, uh, and it is uh, dwarfing other leading causes of death, such as cardiovascular death and cancer at this time. COVID-19 has stymied our best efforts and best medical knowledge as we often watched helplessly 
unable to do anything for some of our sickest patients. But now there's a way to prevent this from happening. Not one vaccine, but three vaccines and all work well and all are very safe. This is a modern day miracle and it is now widely available to many people at high risk to still acquire uh, COVID-19 and become ill and die. The Chickasaw Nation, our pandemic strategy from the beginning was to protect and preserve life and health and maintain essential operations during this COVID-19 pandemic so that we continue to provide services to our citizens to, uh, and to their families and to our communities. Most of our efforts early on in the pandemic were defensive in nature and centered uh, predominantly on public health and workplace policy around screening, occupancy, testing, contact tracing and case investigations, air handling, masking, social distancing, selective uh, shutdown of operations or limiting the amount of personnel that could be uh, on site for operations, hand and surface sanitation and more. With the arrival of this vaccine and these three vaccines, uh, as well as the arrival of monoclonal antibody therapy, we have been able to augment our defensive efforts with an offensive uh, effort. We monitor data continuously and test and actually randomly sample our workforce based on a statistically significant sampling algorithm, which allows us to know our rates of infection within our workplaces at any time with 95% confidence. At all times, we have observed a roughly 50% lower rate of total infections within our employee population versus that in the community, and our contact tracing and case investigation data has revealed virtually no workplace spread. Within our workforce, our seven-day rolling average rate has now fallen to 0.93 of 1%, even while the community rate remains at 5.25 uh, to 3.06%. While these numbers are encouraging, we must remain vigilant, and in order to make COVID go away uh, for the long term, we must vaccinate a significant proportion of our citizens, of our employees, and of our communities. Our efforts to date, within the, Chick the Chickasaw Nation since the start of the pandemic has performed over 105,000 COVID-19 tests and supplied testing using convenient walk-up and drive-through testing centers to our citizens, employees, family members, and the community. Governor Anna Tubby early on declared a state of emergency which allowed the Chickasaw Nation Department of Health provide services not only to our patients, but also to our community members. To date, we have vaccinated almost 27,000 individuals and expect to vaccinate around 30,000 by the end of this week and over 40,000 by the end of this month. Most of our testing has been, most of our vaccination rather, has been limited to date by stable supply of vaccine, which with great thanks to our friends and colleagues at Indian Health Services has been greatly helped with increased supply this week. Over 1,300 educators have also received their vaccine through a CNDH facility to date. Initially in our vaccination efforts, we were open to only a narrow group of individuals to include elders and healthcare workers. Though this required a lot of effort, we were successful in vaccinating a large proportion of our healthcare workers and elders quickly, which allowed us to move on to other priority groups. Our experience indicates that what works to increase vaccines in those who are eligible for vaccination, but may be waiting uh, or resistant to vaccination are as follows. We have to appreciate that the most priority groups will have a distribution of persons that roughly follows Rogers diffusion of innovation curve. Innovators and early adopters are very enthusiastic to receive a vaccine. This group needs to tell their story as it, as it is their stories that often draw in the later adopters and even the laggards who are very resistant uh, to hear the news about vaccination. Consistent messaging is extremely important and it is extremely important that it does not talk down but does speak truth to this information. Physician and medical personnel leadership who receive the vaccine themselves, who tell their story and are willing to reach out and speak to patients is another area where we can improve. I receive numerous questions every day from patients with very easy questions to answer about the vaccine, uh, which were the only questions they really had as barriers to receiving the vaccine. So having us as clinicians and medical personnel tell our experience and our story and also share our knowledge with our patients is of utmost importance. It is also important to be clear about what the benefits of vaccines are, how they are very safe and how this is something we can all do together. And these are all messages that we 
have been consistently trying to put together for our patients and our communities. Workplace and commercial buy-in is another area uh, that is very important if we are going to be successful in our vaccine efforts. Championing the, the COVID-19 vaccine within a workplace or commercial uh, space is a very important motivator uh, to help the public understand why it's important and what it might allow them to do. COVID-19 is not only a threat to our, to our health, but it is also a threat to our economy and our way of life. Vaccination is the best business strategy available. In our planning for the future, we see that offering uh, in ways to improve vaccines is to offer incentives. And those incentives are usually an intrinsic motivation by explaining precisely to a patient in a context that makes sense to them, why the vaccine is important and what it will allow them to do. We also know that we need to continue to increase vaccination and access and speed at which the vaccine is administered. And to do this, uh, we would like to get the community up to at least 85% vaccinated. While we are not there yet, we are very encouraged uh, with the progress we have made thus far. Our four campuses, once fully staffed, will have the capacity to deliver roughly 4,600 vaccines a day uh, to uh, persons that are in need of vaccines. Uh, so we are help, We are encouraged by the progress we've made to date and the progress made in the community, uh, but we would really encourage the rest of the population and the rest of the community uh, to go ahead and get vaccinated. If they have any questions, please reach out to their clinicians. Please reach out to folks that have had a vaccine already and see um, what that experience was and judge for themselves the benefits of receiving this vaccine. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn it back over to Jacqueline McDaniel and thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Dr. Kruger. And thank you again to all our partners. And the Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families is truly proud to stand with the Chickasha Nation, the Oklahoma State Medical Association, OU Health, Mercy, Integris, SSM Health, St. Anthony, and our friends at the Oklahoma Dental Association and Passport Health. The response among our healthcare community has been inspiring. They've done their part in the fight against COVID-19. It's time to do ours. If you have already received your vaccine, thank you. If, you've waiting, if you're waiting your turn, please get vaccinated as soon as you're able. Vaccines save lives. On that, we are united for good. At this time, we'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you to our panelists. Um, just really quickly, if you have questions, um, we'd be happy to take them. We do wanna try to keep them um, focused today on vaccines and on the PSA campaign, but we have some experts on the call. So if you do have questions on those topics, um, you can, can raise your hand and we will unmute you uh, so that you can be recognized. So seeing none, um, I wanna thank you again for coming. Thank you to our panelists. And we will be sending out the news release with the link to the PSA along with a recording of this meeting uh, immediately following the news conference. Thank you very much.